We need a barrier. I said as the tears kept on falling. We will. But first we need to get you looked at. Aura said as White Oak finally let her medics rush over to me. Before they even reached me, however, something strange happened to Mom's body. Her coat and skin turned pale. Then they started to crack. Her eyes dried up. Her body started to slowly turn to what looked like stone. And with a loud crack that made me jump, her body started glowing with a bright golden light. As we all watched Mom's body start to slowly flake away, the golden dust pulled away from where it had lied and started floating towards the open sky above. Little by little, Mom's body turned into that golden dust until the last of it was gone, leaving only a beautiful light glowing and hovering in the air. Miles went wide as the moat of light moved towards, then hovered a few centimeters away from my face. Mom? I asked. But the light just pulled back a little, then moved up and touched my horn. There was the slightest spark as we touched, then the... Light zipped away and followed the dust until it was all nothing more than a memory, leaving this world behind for the next. One of the medics who was close asked, What was that? Aura held me closer as she said, A soul finding its place in a better place. She did enough for this world, and it's time she joined those who've earned their place in the next life. Before more could be said, I moaned in pain and sorrow as every injury in my body started to throb at once. My heart started slamming in my chest, and my head felt as if some pony was hammering my brain. I slumped forward, and the medics rushed closer. The mayor, who seemed to be in charge, told Aura, Set her down on the ground. We can assess the injuries. Slowly, she set me down to the spot where Mom's body was only a moment ago. One of the medics started looking me over. I was left on my stump. Another was going over the slab and cuts on my belly and chest. The mayor who had spoke to Aura started casting a spell over me. A green light bathed my body and she closed her eyes. The last medic moved over to pick up my foreleg, which was sitting a few meters away. White Oak came over and started to speak to the mayor in charge, saying, Dr. Saito, is she going to be okay? The mayor looked back at her. Finishing her spell. Really? Director? Are you serious? She's missing a limb and an ear. She's lost a good amount of blood and has at least four broken bones. Shows signs of eternal bleeding. Her heart already looks ready to fail. And to top it all off, her brain is swelling. I don't know if she can survive the teleportation back to the Ministry. Even if she does, I can't save the leg. I may not even be able to save the heart. I'm baffled at how she's still even alive. Or I didn't like that one bit. She pushed White Oak out of the way and got right in the other mare's face. You listen to me. You'll do everything you can to fix her. I don't care what you got to do. You're going to make her alive. You'll fix her leg, her ear, her heart. I'm not going to watch the mare I love die because of the injuries that that bitch Aquila caused. Dr. Saito took a step back. Miss Aura. I said weakly. Miss Aura, you don't understand the amount of damage her body has undergone. She has less than a 10% chance of surviving the amount of surgery it would take to fix her body. And that's if she's lucky, Dr. Saito explained. White Oak cleared her throat. I was in a similar state when I came to the Ministry Doctor, and your father saved my life. You can do the same. Work with Stormy. She's been working on some new prototypes that might be able to get her up and healthy again. The face Dr. Saito gave White Oak was priceless. It was like she had just ate a lemon mixed with something nasty. You want me to work with Stormy? You know I don't like her. She's so full of herself and always looking at my ass. You will do as I say, Saito, or I'll find another doctor to overtake your department. White Oak said, She's Grimm's daughter, and we owe it to her memory to try our best to save Shadow. Shadow's face fell, and she nodded slowly. Fine, but I'm not making any promises. If she dies, it won't be because of me. I'll do everything I can. 
even work with Stormy if I have to. Do everything you can. Please, Nora said. Fine. We need to get her back to the Ministry right now. I don't know how long she's going to survive laying out here like this. She said with a huff, pulling out a small device. The risk of infection is tremendously high right now. We'll meet you back at the Ministry then. Just get her right to the OR, White Oak said as she turned towards more ponies who were showing up in little flashes of bluish-white light. She looked at the one who was wearing a black leather overcoat and sunglasses. X-598, get a report right away. The strange-looking stallion spoke to White Oak in a monotone voice. We picked up communications from the Steel Rangers. They're sending a team out this way to check out where the disturbance was. They sent a team out to cause some havoc on the other side of the city to try and solve them, ma'am. But I'm afraid that Elder Wolfsbane himself is coming this way no matter what. We have five, maybe ten minutes. Damn that fool. He's always sticking his muzzle where it doesn't belong. She said. Then looked at Dr. Saito. Take Aura with you. I'll send a message to Stormy and let her know what's going on. Now, get going. Yes, ma'am, Saito said, clicking a button on the device she was holding in her magic. I can only take five with me, so we should be able to get the whole team back in one go. Every pony, prepare for transportation in three, two, one... Over the next few hours, maybe days, I can't be sure, my life became nothing but pain. We arrived right in the medical ring of the ministry, and where we met, we were not long after by Dr. Stormy, who looked haggard, tired, and sad all at once. After a quick update about what had happened once she'd left, and the news of Mom's death, she took a few moments to compose herself. It was then that I could see the outstanding control over her emotions. I didn't know Stormy like Mom did, but I'd had a couple of glimpses of her in Mom's memories. She always seemed like a scatterbrained goof with a lustful and fun nature, but I had a feeling when I'd seen her in the last memories as more of an act. Dr. Stormy was rude most of the time, playful some of the time, and always willing to speak her mind, but behind all of that she was an extremely intelligent pony who was in love with another mare she knew she could never have so she did her best to hide how she felt. Mom knew, of course, but Stormy never pushed. It was what made their friendship work so well. Stormy had gotten so good over the years at hiding how she felt about Mom and other ponies. I'm sure that now, faced with the loss of the mare she cared for so deeply, she was able to keep her emotions from overtaking her. She took a few deep breaths, closed her eyes, and stayed like that for a full minute. When she opened them again, she said quietly, I'll have to deal with that later. Right now, professional me is needed. Dr. Saito, prep the OR and get started on what you need to do to keep Shadow alive. I'll get what I need so we can replace what's damaged. She then turned and said more to herself than anyone else. I will not lose my best friend's daughter on the same day I lost her. Goddess has helped me. I refuse to let this day get worse. Once she was gone, everything changed. I was rushed into an operating room within moments of Stormy leaving. More doctors joined us, along with nurses and even synths. Aura followed them in, getting washed up and ready to do... something. I wasn't sure what at the time. I was put under, and they started fixing the damage to my body. First surgery went on for 12 hours, from what I was told. I woke with Aura and Stardust sitting next to my bed. They both informed me on what was going on and what to expect next. I didn't stay awake long due to the trauma my body had gone through. I was in and out for at least a day. Till the next surgery started. This one I had to be awake for. They numbed my body out because they were fitting me for a new leg. They needed me to be awake to make sure everything worked right for the final limb was completed. The ear wasn't that painful, but I was told during the process by Dr. Stormy that it was because the ear didn't have a lot of nerve endings in them. When she got my foreleg, however, even with my stump numbed, I still felt every shock and connection she sent up the limb to check the nerve endings that were giving off. That was after they cut away another couple centimeters of my leg to get the flesh tidy, as Stormy called it. I was then fit with a temporary attachment that would keep me from bleeding out while they grew or built the new foreleg. 
After that, she had to do more and more tests on my heart. Like the goddesses, she didn't have to crack my chest open for that. But the equipment and spell she was using, along with Dr. Saito and her medical team, was still painful, and almost every test made my chest feel as if some pony had just stabbed my heart, or made the thing stop entirely. This went on for a few more hours. After the last test, however, my heart did stop, while I was still awake. That was an experience I never wanted to relive, ever, because it was extremely painful right before my brain started to being starved for oxygen. As I started to pass out, I knew that there was a good chance I wouldn't ever wake up again. So it was quite a shock to me when I did, three days later, hooked up to machines that were pumping my blood for me. I had a nose hose going down my throat to help me breathe. I was told once I was fully awake by Aura that my lungs had been damaged slightly, and mixing that with the old injury I took a while back, they needed to be repaired properly. For the Ministry, repaired meant replacing. So, I spent the next day like this, unable to talk, only able to listen as each of my friends came to visit me while I was being kept alive by machines. And that day was the lowest moment of my life. I felt more helpless than I ever had in my entire life. I couldn't speak, couldn't eat, couldn't hug my friends or even cry. My body barely moved due to the mix of pain and damage it had undergone from the years I dealt with that dark curse, Aquila living inside of me. Battles, mistakes, my own fight against Aquila. Then to top it all off, I had a small injury to my brain. The magical surge of power being freed inside me had nearly made my brain swell to the point of death. They had to release pressure in my skull while I was in surgery, and they had to do it four more times over the past few days. The magic my body was trying to absorb was the entire cause of this, though, and it was slowing down now. Stormy hoped that by the time I went under again, they'd be able to stop draining the pressure in my skull and repair the spots they drilled into. The part I hated was that they had to cut my mane until it was almost non-existent. So Stormy said not to worry because she had a special spell that would make it so it looked like normal when I was better. I hoped so because right now I looked like a fucking strange alien or something with no mane. The bald look wasn't great for me. As the day went on, I started waiting for the next surgery. I heard different news updates from my friends, starting with Stardust, who said... So they say it should only be a few more days, maybe less, before you start to getting around again. Also, they're going to be holding a memorial for your mother when you're out of here. He went on for a bit longer about the plans they were still putting together. Still didn't know why, since it looked like the Ministry was helping us, but maybe they knew something I didn't. In any case, I didn't listen to him much after he talked about Mom, or I visited a little later with Solstice. You look like crap, Solstice said with a small smile. I glared at her, but she just laughed. You can't complain yet, Shadow. You got a tube stuck down your throat. Solstice, now's not the time to be teasing her, Aura said. Her face fell. Sorry, I know. It's just that laughter always helps me feel better in a bad situation. Aura sighed. Yeah. Normally I'm like that, too. Same for Stardust. But still, he's gone through enough. Let's not make things worse for her by making her feel bad, okay? Solstice nodded. Yeah, okay. Then she looked back at me. So I wanted to fill you in on some of the news I got from my mom yesterday. She was finally able to get back to me after I heard the news from you about the attack on Stratus. But I can wait to tell you if you want. I couldn't speak. I was forced to look in your eyes and nod my head a little. Aura frowned, then asked, Does that mean you want to hear what happened? I nodded again, so Solstice took a deep breath and let it out very slowly before saying, There's been problems all over the Enclave. One of the military leaders from Navarro is doing something back east. They think he's trying to work with the goddess on something, or Red Eye, but my mother couldn't get the full details. A couple of mares from back east have been making a lot of trouble for them. The stable dweller, or whoever she is, has been one of the biggest problems they're having. Still, with that said, Navarro sent one of their few to Thunderheads. 
and that's a large military warship, and send it to Stratus. The mayor leading the group is Captain Strife. I guess her team is mostly alive and closer to the west. She was told to meet up with the Thunderhead and lead the attack. She met her brother, Winter Frost, when they got close, and they went after the new High Council. I thought Nightshade was the only High Council pony right now, Cora said. He was, but he brought on two others from his military connections a couple weeks back, I guess. They've been seeing to the day-to-day -day stuff in Nimbus and Stratus for him while he disappears from time to time. That's what my mom said, at least. Though she has no idea he's the stranger, so that's not surprising. Anyway, Stratus was put under siege for three days. In the end, Nightshade knew he couldn't protect the city against a thunderhead. Most of his forces had gone to protect Nimbus and the Crystal Empire from an attack they thought was coming. It was a trick to get Stratus to let his guard down. So Nightshade was going to set up a trap of his own and take hold of the Thunderhead with a small force. He said, Is he crazy? Or asked. I was thinking the same thing, but I just couldn't say it. Not really. Nightshade is one of the best stealth fighters in the Enclave. He probably would have been able to take out Strife and Winterfrost easily, but... Holstice said, but stopped, looking pained. But what? Or asked, her eyes wide. But the other two High Council ponies betrayed him. They knew about the attack, and also... She stopped again for a moment, then continued. This is just speculation on my mom's part. She hasn't gotten full evidence, so I can't be sure, but... She also believes they found out something about what happened to the last High Council ponies. Mom was able to intersect a letter coming from Thunderhead to the other two High Council ponies, saying that Nightstar's, Nightshade's daughter was the courier? Same pony who killed two of the High Council ponies and her protector, the Wrapped Reaper. Or and I both gave her a confused look, as Aura asked, The Wrapped Reaper? Uh, who the fuck is that? Solstice looked embarrassed as she clarified, Oh, I keep forgetting about neither of you know thanks from the Enclave. That's what the higher-ups named the Stranger a few years ago. He's one of the most wanted ponies in the Enclave. Uh, the bounty on his head in caps would be around 400,000 caps. Holy shit, Nora said. I tried saying the same, but almost gagged on the tube. For a few moments of hacking and gagging, I finally stopped. And after another moment of Aura making sure I was okay, Solstice continued. Anyway, the other two council ponies set Nightshade up and... He was captured while he was inside the Thunderhead. He's being held captive in Stratus now, with Winter Frost being put in Nightshade's old place. He's running Stratus now with his sister and the other two traitors from Stratus. The ponies who resisted have fled to Nimbus and the Crystal Empire, who are both resisting any more push from Navarro. The only reason they can do that is because things back east are getting worse. What about your parents? Are they okay? Nora asked. They are at the moment. They're acting as though they're okay with the changes, but there's another problem, she said, looking sad. Winterfrost has decided to bring back the Sins and has tracked them with Finding Shadow and the rest of us. Also, they're sending teams of Enclave Special Forces down into Pegasus and surrounding areas to hunt down Dashites. Soon it'll be dangerous for any Pegasus who's been branded to go anywhere without being attacked by the Enclave. The new Pegasus is safe for Dashites, right? Nora asked. For now, yes. But if they keep pushing, they might be able to overwhelm even Mr. Top's defenses. It was Nightshade who started the treaty with new Pegasus a few years back in the first place. In prison, Winterfrost might just withdraw the treaty unless Mr. Topps gives up the Dashites who call new Pegasus home. He said sadly. I tried to move my only foreleg to try and get something up. But I was thinking across to Solstice, but once again, or I was reading my mind. And then there's only one thing we can do. We have to somehow help Nightshade and Stratus. If we don't, many Dashites, including you and Stardust, won't be safe. Solstice looked even sadder as she said, Even though the two of us aren't technically Dashites because we aren't marked, we are still looked at like we are. 
Even though we have a little time before it becomes a big problem, my mother said as of right now, Nightshade's trial still hasn't started. We have about a week or so before that? Although, if he's found guilty, he'll be executed. Those words were like a stab to my heart. I just loved my mother, and I wasn't going to lose my father so soon afterwards. I couldn't stop myself anymore. The tears fell like rivers. It was like everything in my life was falling apart at once. Mom's gone. I'd most likely never see Dad again. My body was mostly destroyed, and there's no guarantee that I'll fully recover. Nora was still stuck as a pony. Cute or not, she wasn't herself like this. We were trapped hundreds of miles away from our home. New Pegasus was most likely going to be attacked, either by the Enclave, Steel Rangers, or the Romans. His sins were still out there, and for all I knew, they were getting more powerful. And Polori was on death's door himself, and I still hadn't gotten any more news about what his condition was. I still needed to do something about Wolfsbane and so much more. Why does that have to be me? Why can't some other pony take care of all this bullshit? I'm not a real hero, I'm just a pony who got lucky more than once. New Pegasus doesn't need me. I need a real hero, like Blackjack or that stable dweller I've been hearing about. At least they know what they're doing. Okay, from what I heard about Blackjack, she sounded more like a lucky drunk. But even Glory said that she was a scary pony when she wanted to be. What am I? Just a filly who doesn't know when to say no? I'm just a fool who keeps putting her nose in everybody else's business? I just wanted to find my mom. I just wanted to stay safe in my stable and grow old, hitting on my best friend and never knowing, knowing I'd never have her. Maybe I would have found a nice stallion someday in there and had my own foals. And if I just had that life, why couldn't I just walked away from the Mark II when I found it? Yeah, I know. Wildfire was a crazy bitch who deserved what she got, but if I never found out about the Mark II, I wouldn't have known any different. And I knew she was a bitch and a bad overmare, and I could have lived with that. Just Balefire, Milkshake, County Ravane, and myself. Yeah. If I hadn't left, then Wignut would be dead. Aura would still be alone. Mom would have still been crazy, and Stardust would have most likely been caught by the Enclave. A lot of bad things would have happened. But I wouldn't have known any different. I would have been happy, and Mom would have still been alive. A single thought at the end is what... Made my sobs grow worse, and I started choking on the tube again. Zora and Solstice started to panic again, and one ran to get the nurse. I kept on crying because I knew deep down that Mom was the only dead because, once again, she did everything she could to keep me alive. She used too much of her strange magic to tie my life to Aquila's, but she couldn't kill me. The price she paid was her life. It was even worse because she died knowing I was her daughter but still had no memory of me after Aquila was thrown into my body. She would have been better off never knowing that her daughter was still alive. Same goes for Dad. He came down to the surface to help me more and more. He wasn't doing his job because of that, and was going to die. And Glory's in the same boat because of me. It's all my fault. I should have been the one to die. Not them. I started to thrash and pull at tubes and wires all of my body. My sobs grew as I tried to use my magic to just get myself free of everything. Ponies ran into the room right as I was using what power I could try to rip the ventilator tube out of my throat. I got a quick flash of Dr. Uh, Plato with a syringe in her magical hold, then a prick of pain in my neck, and the world faded to black. I awoke a few hours later, feeling a little better. I was still hooked up to way too many machines, but they must have given me something because I didn't feel as horrible as I had when I tried to pull my life support crap out. I looked around and saw Bite sitting next to my bed, looking through something on her pit buck. She saw I was awake and did her best to give me a kind smile, but it didn't last. After a moment passed, she looked in my eyes, saying, I know you're upset about your mom. I know it's hard, and I feel like it's all your fault, but you gotta remember it's not. I felt fresh tears as I tried my best to shake my head. She reached out a hoof and placed it on mine, two Mark IIs resting over each other. After I calmed down a little, she continued. There's a lot going on. You have a lot of stress in your life, and I understand that. 
you need to remember that not everything that goes wrong in your life is your fault, Shadow. Trust me. I know what it's like to lose a parent at a young age. It sucks. That's all there is to it. At least your mother was able to sacrifice her own life for yours. My mom didn't get that chance. She was killed by your uncle, on orders from Grimm. I felt a spark of anger rise up, and if I could speak, I would have yelled, Don't talk about my mom. You have no idea what she had to go through in her life, and your mom was a bitch anyway. She could have lived if she would have just backed down and not sent any pony after my mom. But after a moment, anger entered my head. I might let her own tears fall, as she said. Well, that's not fair. I know my mom did it to herself. She was rash, angry, rude, and thought she was a badass. Truth is, all she had to do was just let her Mark II go and focus on raising me. Her death is as much her fault as it is Grimm's. That's why I finally forgave your uncle and your mom in the end. His life in the wasteland is just messed up. There's not much you can do to change that. So, as much as it sucks, and as bad as it hurts, don't blame yourself or any pony else for what happened to your mom. Don't let her sacrifice go to waste. Get stronger. Get healthy. And stop worrying so much. You couldn't change the past. All you can do is do better. Now get some rest and get well soon. We all need you, Shadow. I can't lose you two. I've lost so much in my life. And you've become like a big sister to me. So don't you go dying when you're getting your operations, okay? If you do, I'll find your ghost and I'll kill you all over again with those idiot hunters. We left the room after that little talk. I started to feel better. At least for the rest of the time I was awake. I was able to keep calm and... I was visited by Windthrasher, saw Wingnut, and listened to Stormy and Saito arguing about what the next steps would be. I heard Storm mention my uncle at one point, but didn't catch everything she said. So as the rest of my day passed, slowly, I started to put myself back together again. I started to look deep into myself, using a form of meditation I learned from Yaksha to start and get my magic under control. It wasn't easy, but in the end... I was starting to understand the power that was now mine. I could understand why it kept getting out of control inside my body and why I couldn't use one of my spells. As night came, I managed to get Stormy to get me a pad of paper to write on. Then I used my magic to write down my request. She gave me a sad smile, saying, I'll get it right away. And if you want, I'll sit with you and explain some things. Maybe I can teach you a few things that grit. Your mother never could. To do her word, Dr. Stormy, the mare I fought in the past was my enemy, even though the one I met was a synth, came back with Mom's spellbook. The one that I'd gotten a few weeks back. The same one that used to belong to Minette herself. She sat me up, and using her magic, she cracked open the very old book and started teaching me the fundamentals of the spells. A few hours passed, and I found out very quickly that most of the spells in the book were way beyond me. Not because I didn't have the power to cast them, because I know I do. Because I like the understanding of what comes from learning weaker and lesser spells. I can end up hurting myself or others if I cast the spells in this book. Stormy took it in stride, though, and put Mom's grimoire down and pulled out a spell book for beginners. She didn't want me using any of the spells out the condition my body was in. However, she was able to explain a lot to me. She figured out that one of the problems I had from when I was younger was that I had a hard time learning a few spells that were in the spell book Mom gave me. It wasn't because I was stupid or not powerful. I just needed a demonstration to grasp the idea of how the spell was formed. She was more than happy to demonstrate different ones throughout the night. As we worked, well, she worked, and I watched. She started to tell me stories. Sorry about her and Mom when they were young. I heard about that Philly Scarlet who used to make Mom's life hell. She told me about the time Mom showed her up in advanced magic theory class. I heard about the cults Mom had crushes on over the years when she was a teenager. She told me about how her and Dad didn't like each other at all when they were still in school. I heard more about the feud between my parents' families over the centuries. She told me stories about the stuff they 
used to get in trouble for back in the day or about how they both worked in the lab. I learned about Mom's life when she was married to my father and the troubles they both went through in the Enclave. Story after story I got to hear, and by the time it was time for me to get more rest, I think both Stormy and I just felt a little bit better. That's how the rest of my time went that day, talking to a pony that I'd thought I'd once killed. Well, she talked. I listened. I wasn't going to complain. I was just glad that even though I'd lost Mom, I still had some pony who knew her so well and could tell me more about who she was. When I first met Stormy, well, the synth version of her, I'd thought she was kind of a bitch with a superiority complex opinion of herself, and that she'd been the one to start the program that Stardust grew up in. In reality, she was still the same pony who started the Devil's Children program, but she wasn't as bad as I'd thought. I could see the similarities between her and her synth, but she wasn't the same pony. One day I'll ask her about the program, but right now I just enjoy her company. Finally, our time came to an end when one of the nurses came in and told Dr. Stormy that she was needed in finishing up one of the synth parts she was making for me. She was also told that I needed my rest before tomorrow's procedure. She told the nurse she'd leave in a few moments, and again we were left alone. Stormy got to her hooves, but didn't leave right away. Instead, she took a long look at me. It was almost like she was trying to see the similarities between myself and Mom. After a moment, she smiled. An expression I knew from Mom's memories that Stormy didn't put off very often. She then moved close and ran a hoof over my dirty mane. She leaned down and kissed the tip of my horn, then whispered, It's amazing how much you look like both your parents. You have a strong will and even stronger resilience. I can't wait to see the mare you'll grow up to be. Now... Get some rest, and tomorrow we'll make you whole again. Good night, little star. Without another word, Dr. Stormy left the room. I watched her go, a bit confused by her motherly gesture. Then I just did my best to get some sleep. It didn't take long, even though I'd spent most of the day in bed. Looked up to goddesses knows how many things. I was still exhausted. Soon I found myself in another dreamless sleep. One good thing I could say about being this tired and mentally drained is that it was a lot easier to sleep. I had no nightmares of what happened to me in that cave.